morning. Welcome to Cathedral Faith Ministry on this morning. We'd like to thank each and every one of you who may be tuning in by the way of Facebook or YouTube. We just want to say thank you. And those of you who are here in the sanctuary, it is always good to see you. Amen. Amen. Our scripture reading for today will be coming from Psalms 61. Psalms 61. And it reads thus. Hear my cry, O God. Attend unto my prayer. From the end of the earth will I cry unto thee. When my heart is overwhelmed, lead me to the rock that is higher than I. For thou has been a shelter for me and a strong tower from the enemy. I will abide in thy tabernacle forever. I will trust in the covert of thy wing. For thou hast for thou, for thou, O God, has heard my vow. Thou has given me the heritage of those that fear thy name. Thou will prolong the king's life and his years as many generations. He shall abide before God forever. O prepare mercy and truth, which may preserve him. So will I sing praises unto thy name forever that I may daily perform my vows. This I have read Psalms 61, 1 through 8. May God add a blessing to the reading of his word. Let us pray. Oh, gracious Father, we come thanking you once again, oh God, for allowing us, oh God, to come to your house of worship. Lord, we just want to say thank you, Lord. Lord, you've been better to us than we've been to ourselves, oh God. And for that, Lord, we just want to say thank you. Thank you, Father God. Lord, we ask, oh God, that you just touch on this morning, oh God. Lord, send your anointing in this place on this morning, oh God. Hallelujah. Touch the praise team on this morning, oh Hallelujah. Lord, we ask, oh God, that you be with our bishop, oh God, hallelujah, our first lady, oh God, hallelujah. Father God, give them, oh God, what they stand in the need of, oh God, hallelujah. Lord, we praise you, we honor you, magnify your name on this morning, oh God, hallelujah. Lord, we ask, oh God, that you be with those in the nursing home and hospitals, oh God. Oh, Father God, we ask that you soothe their pain, oh God, on this morning. Oh God, we ask you to touch, oh God. Have mercy upon them in a special way, O oh God. O oh God, we ask, O oh God, that you be with our children, O oh God. Touch them in a special way, O oh God. O oh Father God, because they need you right now, Lord God. So much going on in the world, O oh God, so we just need you right now, Lord God. Hallelujah. Lord, we praise you. We honor you. We magnify your name, O oh God. Father God, we'll be so careful to give you the honor and give you the glory. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Praise the Lord. Good morning, everyone. We're glad to see you all here this morning. We're glad for those of you who are tuning in on Facebook or Facebook or YouTube watching us. As we're getting ready to go into the praise portion of our service this morning. I just want to encourage you. Last night I heard a message that simply said don't give up. Don't give up. Yeah. Don't throw in the towel. Number one, God has been too good to us yeah. to throw in the towel. Now he's been too good. His name is too great for us to quit now. Hallelujah. So don't give up. If you need strength, it's available to you. Yes. If you need courage, it's available to you. If you need wisdom for the journey, it's available to you. Just reach out and trust him. Hallelujah. He is your strength on this morning. Don't give up. Strength like no other 
are my strength. Yes, you are God. Strength like no other. You won't fail. Strength like no other. It reaches to me. Sing that again. You are my strength. You are my strength. Oh, yes, you are. Strength like no other. Yes, strength like no other. It reaches me in the fullness, in the fullness of your grace and the power, in the power. The name of Jesus, you lift me up. Darkness, my God, that is who you 
They had a song that they would sing when they needed to stay in the race. They had to encourage themselves to stay in the race yes. and not to give up. They knew the journey might be hard, it might be long, but they were determined. Their mind was made up. Yes, and yes. they sang a song like this, say, I will trust in the Lord. I will trust in the Lord. I will trust in the Lord until I die. might be hard but they said they were gonna stay on I'm gonna stay on the battlefield I'm gonna stay on the battlefield I'm gonna stay on the battlefield till I die until I die treat everybody right yes we do I'm gonna treat everybody no matter what they do I have to I'm gonna treat everybody if I want to see Jesus I'm gonna treat everybody right till I die till I Until I Yes, I will. Oh, I will trust in the Lord. I will trust in the Lord. I will trust in the Lord.
Praise the Lord, everybody. Praise the Lord, everybody. Everybody ought to. Y'all sound real quiet talking about praising the Lord. Everybody ought to. Can we stand on our feet and give him a hand clap of praise or do something? God brought us to a whole nother week. We need to be grateful and glad somebody didn't make it. Somebody didn't see this Sunday that was here last week. Amen. We trust in the Lord. Amen. We did it the last two, three, two Sundays or three Sundays. We're going to do it again. Get out your seats. Stay out your seats. Go greet somebody that you didn't lay down with last night and wake up with this morning and tell them, God bless you. You look good today. Amen. Ain't nothing like fellowshipping with the saints. Amen. So easy. I know that song, Marvin. So easy. So easy, easy to love, amen. Look at somebody tell them that Jesus in me loves the Jesus in you, amen, amen, amen. We give honor to our first um, lady, Dr. Peggy Johnson in the back. We give honor to our pastor and founder, Bishop Richard Johnson. So glad to see them in the house of the Lord today. Can we give them a hand clap of praise? Thank God for keeping them. Amen. Amen. I'm going to deviate a little bit um, before I go into the word. I'm not going to do a whole lot of announcements today. But dear friend of our family, um, um, Dr. Johnson, Mother Johnson, put it in the chat that um, Elder Watson, him and his wife, were in a very bad accident um, in the low country this week. Um, my mother's from Saluda, and they... Um, the Watson pastors, the church that my grandmother and grandfather were a part of, found in that church. Um, very close friends of ours. I've known them, up, I feel like, all my life. Had a very bad accident. God spared their life, so we, we can give them a praise for sparing their life. Amen. Y'all can be a little, do a little better than that. Um, but it does not change that the accident was very, was very bad, so I didn't notice until a couple years ago, but Elder um, Watson and um, First Lady Carrie Watson are actually very good friends of Elder Donald and um, Sister Yvonne Donald. So I just asked him, I put him on the spot a few minutes ago, wanted him to, because I know he's been down that way checking on them, wanted him to give us an update on um, where things are going with them. I mean, when I say they are good, it's not just church good folk, but they just good folk. When Bishop was in the hospital in Atlanta, um, they were one of, Sister Watson was one of the first people to call um, and ask mom, you know, what's going on? What, I'm sending something for you, you know, let us know if you need anything. That's how long we and how far we go back. So I want to give Elder Donald a second to kind of tell us what's going on, give us an update. We've been praying, but he's closer to the situation than me. So um, let's receive him now by saying amen. amen. Let's start by saying praise the Lord. And I'm, I'm going to say, uh, Sister, Sister Johnson, Excuse me. Excuse me. Well, I was going to say Sister John. Sister, sister, excuse me for saying it like that. Sister Peggy. Been knowing probably um, Sister Carrie all her life. And uh, they grew up in Saluda. And so that's how far they go back. Um, Elder El Watson and Sister Watson and El Young, um, the former pastor, he's passed away. Her father was very close to me. Definitely, the Watsons are very close to me. We uh, we vacation together. Matter of fact, we probably do everything together. So, um, it's a it's a hurting time right now. But um, I'm going to be short, and I'm going to. Uh, and I, I'm, um, Mike gave me this time because he, I guess he wanted me to go a little detail uh, about what happened. Uh, they had a head-on collision heading to uh, Beaufort to visit their son, trying to get, get a little rest. And even before um, be, before they went there, I, I called him. I said, man, you need to take a little rest. And, and, um, and they was expressing that that's what we're doing right now. As they was driving to Beaufort, um, a car swayed, swayed off in 
directly in their lane. And that was Watson who tried to uh, sway out, sway uh, another way, keep from getting hit. Uh, and uh, his wife uh, got the greatest impact. She's about, about 75% of her body, uh, my estimation, is probably broken up. You just don't know, and I think all of us take it, you don't know you can be here today, fine and well, and minutes later, you can be in a different situation. Uh, she has, both of her legs were broken, um, ankle bone broken, um, her sternal um, crack, um, bleeding behind her, behind her. Uh, her face, they had to sew up her tongue, uh, and I'm gonna tell I'm, I'm gonna get a little more detail than that. That um, that the legs was not only broken, but when the impact of the car, the bones came out of her skin, was the legs concerned, and they had to take rods and tack it back in, and uh, and that's one thing. <coughs> and uh, she had bleeding behind her sternum. She's been heavily sedated, and uh, they had to do something with her um, spine, or spine, messed up her spine a little. But the good thing, God is a great God. Now she was supposed to be dead, but God is a good God. Every operation that she ever had, very successful. And then they all, also they say that <clears throat> that that she's going to be able to walk again. <laughs> God is a good God. And um, <clears throat> she got fingers broken, um, right arm broken. Uh, she can squeeze with, with one arm, and she can open her eyes. She can, I think that she can talk, but um, and sometimes they don't tell her to talk. She, they, they just tell her to, um, she can squeeze with his arm, and so she's, she's relating to them. <clears throat> and, um, and so God is able. Don't tell me what God is not able to do. And if you saw that car, you say, how in the world she got out of there? Oh, Watson on the other end, and, and I didn't tell everything. That's just, you know, that's, I just told a few things. El Watson on the other end, he has, he, he, he had head trauma, so bleeding of the brain, uh, and also he has one crushed leg and <clears throat> not only one crushed leg he has a broken arm on the right hand side and um, and so and out of all that he's able to um, to talk with you uh, and he's able to um, and uh, but both of them are heavily sedated they need your prayers. Yeah. They need your prayers. They need your prayers. I try to tell people this. They need your prayer more than your, your visitation. And we're going to ask the church to continue to pray for them. God is omnipresent. People need to realize this. God is omnipresent. And where you want to be, God is already there. So pray for them. And pray for his family. He has three kids and pray for him. And he, like I said, he, he is a very dear friend of mine. And so y'all pray for him and pray for him. In Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you, Elder Donald. I know that was tough. I have people I'm close to that's basically the equivalent to something happened in the Caldwell and his wife. We go on vacation together in the past. We, we hang out and we do stuff. Um, when something like that happens close to you, shakes you a little bit. I said last week, and I um, say it quite often, because I've experienced it myself in 2024. You know, your life can change just like that, just like that. You can everything can be in place, and everything looking and feeling normal, and you get a phone call, and, and everything has changed. So um, he didn't. I don't know. I can't remember if he said it just now or not. Um, but they're in two different locations. They're in two different cities. 
So you got one person in one city, and his wife is in one city, he's um, in another city, what about 45 minutes away to an hour? So imagine your parents are an hour away dealing with everything they're dealing with, and, and you're trying to figure out what's going on and because someone came across the, um, the road. So um, at this time, again, we'll do something different, do it quickly. Um, I'm going to ask Brother um, Cedric Tucker to come up lead us in the work. I want to pray for him. I also want to talk about prayer. So many people say, Lord, we're praying for you, and y'all don't mean that. As soon as you say it and walk away, you forgot to pray. We're going to say a quick word of prayer for them and then be going into the word. But I feel like it's that important. If it was you, you would want someone to pray for you, wouldn't you? Amen. Amen. Let us stand. Let us stand. Lord God, we come to you as humbly as we know how, Lord God. We thank you, Lord God, always for another day that you've given us. We thank you, Lord God, in a lot of instances for this grace and mercy, Lord God. It hits home more now than anything that's restored every day, Lord God. We thank you, Lord God, for having family, church, and just trusting and knowing that you are a healer. You said by your stripes that you are healed. Lord God, help us stretch out our hands of love to each other, Lord God. We one for another are going through different situations. Our, our elder and our sister Carrie and Elder Watson are going through, Lord God, we ask you to cover their families, Lord God. Cover their travel, Lord God. They're in two different locations, Lord God. Give them peace of mind, Lord God. We thank you for right now, today, for being in our right minds, able to praise you and worship you, able to encourage each other, Lord God. You said, forsake not the assembly of the saints, Lord God. We praise and we worship and we thank you, Lord God, for this time. Lord God, help us to remember those that are dealing with bereavement. Help us to deal with those that are also in other places in hospitals, finding other situations, frustration and depression, Lord God. Help us to band together and remember that, Lord God, we are family. We are your people, Lord God. We must believe and trust in you. Wrap our arms around each other. You said when we cry, we cry. And when we're happy, we're happy, Lord God. Continue to cover us with your blood, Lord God. And we thank you and we'll praise you. Let's end with praising our Lord God. Let's praise him, praise him, clap your hands and say thank you, Jesus. Say thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Amen. Now, thus, us that are in the house of the Lord that can move with our bodies, we can move with our feet. We shouldn't have to be pumped to praise God after hearing what they're going through. We should be able to fill this house with at least 30 seconds of praise and we can thank God. Hey, I can move. I can lift my hands. I can clap. Somebody can't clap, somebody can't move, somebody can't walk. But we have the ability to do all of them. So we owe God a better praise than how we sound this morning. I promise you I won't be up here long. If you praise him, maybe I'll be a little shorter. <laughs> God is good. We claiming victory in Jesus' name. They're going to walk out that hospital and everything's going to be all right. So whatever's going on in your family, you're going to be all right too. Look at your neighbor and say, it's already done. We're going to be all right. God is in control because God is the greatest power. We shall never be defeated because God is the greatest power. We shall never be defeated. Amen. So we praise him like we're not defeated. We praise him like we already got the victory in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 All right. Let's get into the word. It's Sunday summertime as we started riding down in columbia the temperature just kept going up and up and up and up and we got here and i said man i used to people used to pick on me you from south carolina yeah where you from i'm from columbia oh that's the armpit of the south and i was like wow and then you get away and you move away and you realize like yeah it is a little extra hot <laughs> in Colombia, so we thank God for everyone that's in the house today we know we got a lot of people still traveling sister um, Dorothy Moore she texted me on I think it was Wednesday evening and said she had arrived to um, I forgot what state she's in but her daughter was graduating from um, basic training so Doc got on the plane for the first time <laughs> yes she did I asked her how did she do she said I was it was okay I got a little sick but I was all right I said, okay, let me leave that alone. But I know she's traveling summer, still doing the vacation summertime. So do your thing. Enjoy time with your family. Um, the, the, the church is here, but we always want to make sure we spend time with our family. Amen. All right, let's get into the word. I'll do announcements later. I'm the only person between you and your brunch. So let me get you to your brunch. Um, but we're going to go to the word. 
Uh, we're going to go to um, the, the second chapter of Mark this morning. Um, we're going to do something a little different, passage of scripture that's a little different from my perspective on today, what we're going to talk about. Two weeks ago, if you didn't listen to the sermon, um, this is the week leading up to, it was June the 30th, leading up to 4th of July, I preached a sermon, a message that still sounds crazy to me to be saying preach the sermon. Um, I was up here talking about something, <laughs> um, freedom of speech that Sunday morning. Now, for me, I was nervous about that message. I didn't might not have told y'all that I was nervous because I thought I'm, I'm not coming from a perspective or talking about something um, leading up to the 4th of July that people are normally accustomed to hearing. Um, normally, the 4th of July message is about, you know, we're free, you know, free to praise him, you know, this, that, and other. And I know that y'all have been waiting on me to preach a happy sermon because some of these sermons have been cut and beat. And I'm like, Lord, give me a happy sermon. <laughs> he didn't do it on that Sunday. But the sermons, um, the message I was probably one of the most concerned about how it came over was the complete total opposite. I was in the pulpit getting text messages about, wow, this, that, and other people asking follow-up questions, um, asking me, you know, how do you respond to people saying things to you and spitting venom at you because we use the word venom and poison at you how do you respond to it how do you do this that and other i mean it, it the, i was shocked i was shocked about the response but then the, the reality of it was it showed me um two things a lot of people are spitting out a lot of bad words <laughs> a lot of people saying some craziness to people and a lot of people receiving it a lot of people receiving it so this sermon today, this message today is going to be a continuation, but from a different perspective of um, the freedom of speech message. And the title of this message is They Always Got Something to Say. Look at your neighbor, look at somebody close to you, look at someone across the way, said, They always got something to say. They always got something to say. So, what do you respond? How do you respond when they always got something to say? So, I asked God, I was, I was looking through my like, Lord, what do, what do I say? Can show me something, lead me to something that can speak to um, passage in the, in the scriptures in the Bible where people always had something to say and how someone might have responded to it. Again, I'm going to approach this passage of scripture from a different perspective, maybe a little different than what you might have um, heard before. Cedric, go ahead and cut two and three off for me. Um, but it's applicable. It's applicable. So tell somebody in your in your in your phone, your text message. Tell them to log on. You you need to hear this. It's applicable to everyday life because if you know what I know, whether you're at work, whether you're at home, whether you're in the church, and some people were talking about some of the things they heard were in the church. The one thing this is um, the common denominator is is people always have something to say about what you're doing. What you, what you got going on in your life? You know, something could be going good. Uh, I wonder how he, what he did to get that. Things going bad, I just knew they wasn't no good. So it doesn't really matter which angle you come from. Someone's got something to say. I'm looking at my young man right here. When you're in school and, and you're not doing the, the wrong thing, people are going to have something to say. Well, why? He, he think he's too good to hang with us? Well, well, we, you too good for us? But then when you're doing something bad, then the same folks turn around. I knew he was going to, I knew it was in him. He wasn't going to ever do good. Regardless of which way you go, someone's going to have something to say. So when you look in the Bible, Jesus was on this earth 33 years approximately. But his time in ministry and him walking the earth in ministry was really only about three years. And in that time period, there was a group of people that always had something to say about everything that he was doing. Y'all know who that group was? And there's actually more than one. We focus on this group more. There's actually six in New Testament and old. But one group that had the, that we talk about or we see in Scripture the most, and that was the Pharisees. Pharisees were a group of individuals that were religious leaders. They were responsible for managing the synagogue. And they were, first things first, Pharisees means separated. So they felt like there's certain things that the Messiah or the, the coming God shouldn't be, do, shouldn't be doing. So first things first, they didn't like God for several reasons. They didn't like Jesus, excuse me, for several reasons. One of the first ones was he rolled and hung out with people who were sinners. And they said, okay, there's no way he can be the son of God if he's hanging out with these folks because you're not, he's supposed to be separated, come amongst them and be separated. Some of y'all use that scripture as reason not to 
hang with your family now. The devil is a liar. It's not what it meant. But he's, they thought, okay, he's not supposed to be hanging out with sinners. He's walking on earth, hanging around with sinners, talking to them. And he wasn't embracing them, going after the religious establishment. He was going after the unsaved. Um, they didn't like him also because he's from Nazareth. Felt like the, the, he ain't, the, the Messiah can't be coming from Nazareth. He's supposed to come from a certain city. Um, you know, he can't come from there. They actually begin to be envious of him as well because um, them being responsible for managing the synagogue meant that people were accustomed to coming to them for spirituality. And here is Jesus popping up. People, he's beginning to be more popular. People are following him. He's performing miracles. And their influence is dwindling. So they're not, people aren't coming to the Pharisees um, for anything. They're looking, at, they're looking to Jesus. They're starting to follow him. Um, and their influence is dwindling. So no, in, in, even in natural life, you know, people can't stand when their influence falls off. When you're not the popular person and people aren't following you. And then lastly, he was doing something that irritated the Pharisees to no end. You know what that was? Jesus was performing miracles on the Sabbath. And what's so funny about it, we're not going to, for the sake of time, we're not going to go through the miracles that he performed, but he kept doing it. It's not one or two. He kept performing miracles on the Sabbath, and he was doing it right in their face. They were right there. Now, see, and we're going to read here in Scripture. He goes, we're gonna, I'm going to go through. I'm not going to read it all and go back. We're going to read it and go through it at the same time. You would think if you hated the man so much, you would just stop following him, right? Isn't that what you would do? Our sister um, from the color purple from North Carolina said, if you don't want me, don't talk to me. Go on free yourself. Wouldn't you think you would just free yourself and stop following him? But that's not what they did. And it's, this lesson's going to teach us a valuable, valuable lesson about some, I'm gonna, and it's got a bunch of, this is a good story. It's a good story. So it's, I'm going to talk about some things to look out, characteristics of people who always got something to say, and then also how we can respond. So let's go to Mark chapter 2, verses 23. Mark chapter 2, verse 23. We're going to do a little bit of reading, but I promise you it will keep your attention. You're going to enjoy it. This is a good story. This is like a movie, you ask me. Um, the Bible, the living word of God, is it, it, it works back then, and it works now. Let us say a quick word of prayer. Lord, we thank you for this day. We thank you for this opportunity. Lord, we ask that you um, use us, open up our hearts and minds to receive your word. Move us out the way that um, decrease, I might decrease, that you might increase. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Eyes to see, ears to hear, mind to re um, comprehend, a heart to receive. Amen. All right, so let's go to verse um, 23 in Mark chapter 2. I was actually going to start at Mark chapter 3, but um, late Friday night, I felt like, you know what, give the background that leads to Mark chapter 3. It'll make sense. So, again, I'm going to give you six points, six things that stuck out about these, this passage of Scripture, some characteristics of people who have something to say that are applicable to our life. So let's go to verse um, 23 of Mark chapter 2. Now, it happened that when, they, um, that when he went through the grain fields, on the Sabbath, and as they were his, his excuse me, and as they went, his disciples began to pluck heads of grain. And the Pharisee said unto him, "Look, why do you? I mean, excuse me, why do they um, want? Um, excuse me, let me slow down. Look, why do they do what is not lawful on the Sabbath?" So let's address this. They're walking through the passage, hungry, getting some grain. And again, this is an example. The Pharisees don't really care for Jesus, but they are still there. Now, I was wondering in my mind, I wonder if they were really just following him and the disciples or if they were just like in the, in the grains, you know, kind of in the back hiding out. Like, we're going to watch him and see. We're going to catch him, this, that, and the other. So the, the first point I want you to write down is um, people who always have something to say, they are always present. They're all, write that down, they are always present, even when you don't see them. They're always present. Now, when, in today's world, when you have social media, it's real easy for somebody to keep up with everything you're doing. 
got something to say about everything you're doing and you don't even know. Because they, they, don't, they don't have to look at your profile and look at what you say and this, that, and other and let you see it. Especially when you're on YouTube, they can just pop in, pay attention, and then go somewhere and throw some darts. Oh, did you see what he said? Did you see what he's doing? The Pharisees are somewhere in the field while Jesus and the disciples are walking through. And they are plucking grain because they're hungry. Plucking grain to eat. And what they say in verse uh, 24, and the Pharisees said unto them, Look, why do they do what is not lawful on the Sabbath? Hold on. Where did you come from? All of a sudden now, you got something to say. And we weren't talking to you. I wasn't talking to the, Jesus wasn't talking to the Pharisees. I could imagine the disciples was probably having their own conversation. And all of a sudden you hear, hey, it ain't lawful to, to, to pick the grain. What you doing? It's not lawful to pick the grain. Isn't that how people do you? You just be minding your business at work and you're in the, in, the, in, the, in the lunchroom. I guess we don't have no lunchroom. You take in your break going to lunch and then somebody walks by like, hey, uh, I heard such and such. Hold on, who, where, where did that come from? What, I didn't say nothing to you. Minding your own business. The disciples are minding their own business. And then here comes the Pharisees with something to say. They're everywhere. They go with him everywhere he goes. Whether they, whether they, they acknowledge, hey, Jesus, we here. They're always there waiting to try to catch him up. So let's see what um, the response Jesus has in verse 26, which is this is when it gets good. But he said to them, have you read what David did when he was in need and hungry and he and those with him? Okay, um, this is referring to 1 Samuel chapter 21. David is in this particular point. He is running from Saul, He's running from Saul. We all know about how David was in the wilderness, running from Saul, went from place to place to place. We actually talked about that not too long ago. And he gets to a point when they're running and they get hungry. Verse 26, how he went into the house of God in the days of uh, Abiathar, the high priest, and ate the showbread, which is not lawful to eat except for the priest, and also gave some of those um, who were with him. So what Jesus is explaining is, in this particular point in time, showbread was set aside preserved for the high priest everybody wasn't it wasn't available for everyone everyone wasn't supposed to eat it G, um, David sees the, the the priests have to make a decision do we let David just die and be hungry out here and the men with him or do we feed him so Jesus is asking uh, again when you keep in mind the Pharisees are the people who are biblical scholars so let's go back if you look at this is to all of my children this I'm, let me say this to you when your mama asks you a question about certain things she probably already know the answer men when your wife asks you where you been she probably already know where you've been she just trying to see what you're going to say when jesus asked the scribes i mean the pharisees have you never heard, I mean, have you never read what David did when he was hungry and needed to, um, and when he was in need and needed to feed the hungry? That was, Jesus was kind of being a little sarcastic. Like, okay, you, you, the, you the biblical scholar, did you not read what, you know, David did when he was running from Saul? Jesus got a little snarky with him. Like your wife said, hey, man, um, <laughs> what you been doing this evening? She already know what you've been doing this evening. She wants to see if you're going to tell the truth. Jesus is saying to the Pharisees, um, you the biblical scholars, you read all day. You've been the scriptures all day. Do you not remember what David did when he was running from Saul and they were hungry and had no food? And the priests decided to, instead of follow the law and not let them eat, he decided to feed David with the showbread, which was unlawful, it was not lawful, and he gave something for them to eat. He's asking them a question. Is it more important to you to do it your way, which you feel like is the law, versus to have humanity towards somebody who's hungry? You know the word. So remember, that's, that's, that's say the Pharisees is church folk. You in the church every Sunday. You know the word. You know what God said about doing to your neighbor. But did you forget what, David, what, was, what was done for David by the high priest and feeding the showbread? Are you not thinking about me 
and my disciples here now hungry? He's drawing a parallel. So the second thing, the second characteristic you can see from people who always have something to say, they care more about being right than doing right. Write that down. They care more about being right than doing right. Wouldn't it be more important to make sure someone doesn't die of hunger than to read them the law? Did Jesus make the, first of all, the, the, the Sabbath was part of the Ten Commandments. He told also to not add nothing to it or take anything away from it. The Pharisees and those six group of people, uh, those six groups of, um, that I was referring to earlier, they started adding their own rules to the Sabbath. They started adding their own rules. And what's so unique about it is the rules they were adding, they were different from each group. So the Pharisees had their group of rules around the Sabbath, and the Sadducees had their group of um, rules around the Sabbath, and they didn't always align. But then you were judging people and condemning people according to the rules that you added that might have been different. Like, it's, you, you're, not, you weren't, you're not supposed to look in the mirror on the Sabbath because that's work. You couldn't um, move or more than a mile. I think it was three-fourths of a mile because that was considered work. And people died because of things they did on the Sabbath that God never said. So people who always have something to say, they are the people who always feel like them being right is more important than actually what God is saying for you to do to your brother and your sister. This is your girlfriend there to tell you on the telephone, um, what happened, girl? He did what? You know what, I don't, girl, I don't know that I would take that. Mm. Yeah, I don't know if I'd take, oh, hold on a second, hold on a second, hold on, hold on. Yeah, baby, I, I gotta call you back, my husband calling me. Hold on now, you telling someone to walk away from their man, but you got yours at home. The, the, these are the Pharisees. This is the brother who, man, you know what? I wouldn't take that, man. I wouldn't. She ain't cooked no food for you. She ain't cooked dinner, man. You, you, man, I don't know that I would deal with that. Hey, hold on a second. Baby, what you want to eat? What you want me to call some takeout? Hold on now. You doing takeout, but you telling him to walk away from his wife because she don't cook. That's what you call people that just like to talk and say things. They want to be right. But you ain't even following what you're saying. So how does Jesus respond? He responds to him with the word. And he said to them, the Sabbath was made for man and not the man for Sabbath. Therefore, the son of man is also Lord of the Sabbath. Now, Jesus, did he hit him with the double whammy? He, that was a triple punch. The Sabbath is made for the, the Sabbath was made for man and not the man for the Sabbath. Therefore, the son of man is the Lord of the Sabbath. What is God saying? Do you know who you're talking to? I created the Sabbath for man. I'm the, I'm the Lord of, of the Sabbath. You don't tell me what to do on the Sabbath, but did you think that stopped him? What does that tell you? If you were talking to Jesus, you followed the man doing all these miracles, and he tells you, the Sabbath was made for man and not the man made for Sabbath. Therefore, the son of man is also the Lord of the Sabbath. And you don't care. Do you think they care what you say? No. What you say, you can, you can give them the word. It's not going to stop them. Some people are intent on just throwing shade. You can't change that. You, can, you, you would never be able to stop some people from throwing shade. So then we go to verse, then we go to Matthew chapter 3. Now, what, let's go to Matthew chapter 3, verse 1. We got about six verses to read, and we're going to be done. It gets juicy. Now, the first thing I want you to notice is Jesus does not give them a chance to respond. He doesn't ask them, how do you feel about what I said? He goes straight to verse 1 in Mark 3, and he's moving. He's moving. So I wanna, that's, a, that's a little side note right there. Um, somebody here, you stopped what God called you to do because of what someone said to you. You got the words, you took the venom, you took the poison that, of what someone said to you. The person has always got something to say. You let it discourage you, you stop moving. 
God gives you a clear example. He, don't spe he doesn't spell it out here, but take note. When we start reading verse 1, he doesn't stop and say, now, now we shall enter. The, he, just, he said what he said and he just move on. Hey, man, I gave you the word. I'm not, I don't care what you got to say. I'm moving forward because I got something else to do. So let's go to Mark chapter 3. And, and that, again, quick word. Someone today, you need to get back on the track. You have let, you've gotten off the track because you let what someone else said to you, what someone said about you, stop you from what God told you to do. Why? Don't stop, won't stop, can't stop. You got to get back on the track and keep moving because guess what? You will never get to where you're trying to go if you can't take criticism. Someone is going to always have something to say about you. Michael got on a yellow shirt with blue stripe. He should have wore a blue shirt with yellow stripe. It's summertime. We dress down. Why he don't have on a suit? Somebody going to always have something to say. You can, if I wore a suit, I, he look hot up there. He look hot. He trying to look holy, y'all. Look at him. He, he look at him. He don't changing up. He trying to dress holy. Holy is not a look. It's a lifestyle. It's a lifestyle. And it's a lifestyle that don't start here at the church. Matter of fact, I don't really care what you do here. If you can't be holy in the church, you need to get to the altar. That's a whole different problem. The living a holy lifestyle is not how you, it's not a dress to the floor. It ain't a, it ain't a suit with a white shirt and a blue suit, suit, white shirt, red tie, dark suit. You came up in environments, dark suit and red tie. You, you, that ain't what it is. You, if you're taking communion with your suit on and think that make you holy, and you go outside and you, you, you ain't holy, God said, I don't know what you're doing. I don't, you know, we were talking about, and I'm, getting, I'm not getting on subject, but we talked about this last week. Marvin said something. I was like, wow, Marvin, that was profound. <laughs> Marvin said, and I hope you don't mind me sharing this. Marvin said, yeah, I think some folks can get to heaven and be like, wow, Jesus. I didn't know I could have lived a better life doing, I, I didn't think I could do anything. She here, and I thought I couldn't. Yeah, that's because some of y'all are caught up in the law. You've been taught the law. Somebody ain't never played marbles your whole life because somebody said, marble not. Y'all realize that, right? That's, that's like real. That's, that's a real thing. Some people have been in bondage because of the law. And then, I'll, let's go a step further. Misinterpretation of the law. Misinterpretation of the law. Let me shut up because I was about to say something. I'm going to make somebody mad. When you really look at this thing, the Pharisees and the other groups, that's doctrines. It's doctrines. It's modern-day doctrines. Some of these doctrines that folks have followed, they have no biblical basis behind them. It is an opinion. It's an opinion that you got caught up following. You ain't enjoy Christmas, Resurrection Sunday, Easter. You ain't enjoy nothing. You, you, you're just following what someone told you, and there is no biblical principle behind it. And God is looking at you saying, hey, man, I didn't tell you to do that, but if that's what you want to do, hey, you're going to get to heaven and be like, man, Lord, I guess I could have went to the ball game. And me and Carl were going to be like, yeah, we was there. We was at the ball game. Let me leave y'all alone because some of y'all are like, I, I don't want to do Christmas no more. I'm going to do Christmas. Amen. Hallelujah. Let me, shout, let me move on. Mark chapter 3. I gave you two, and two, um, two characteristics, two things you should watch out for. We're getting ready to go up on the, three, on the third one. And he entered the synagogue. Didn't talk to nobody. He just started walking. Now, again, entered the synagogue. Who manages the synagogue? I told y'all earlier, who manages the synagogue? The Pharisees. So he walks into their house. Take note of that. Jesus walks into their worship establishment, where they worship at. Y'all run the synagogue, and a man who was there with a and a man was there with who had a withered hand. Now we're gonna talk about this a little more. I was I, I just thought to myself, I know Jesus had to say to himself, Y'all so know the word. The first thing I see when I walk in the synagogue is this man who has a need. How long have y'all ignored this man's need talking about the law? First thing he sees is a man who has a withered hand. Verse 2. So they watched him closely. The third thing you need to pay attention to with people who always got something to say, 
which I think it is, they watch you closely. They watch you closely. They're not just why it's not just enough to watch you. They in your business and you just don't know it. They're the people that would, they will befriend everyone around you just to try to know what you're doing and you don't know. You thinking, you know, hey man, they don't care nothing about me. They, they, they ain't around them, but we broke up. Mm -mm. You can stalk somebody so easy on the internet nowadays because y'all put all your information out there, all your business. It's on Instagram and, and Facebook and all of that. They, they are watching you closely. They're paying attention to your move. They're in your business, whether you see it or not. Write that down. Third thing is they watch you closely. Let's go back to the scripture. So they were watching. So, so they watched him closely, whether he would heal him on the Sabbath so they might accuse him. The fourth thing you have to watch out for is they make accusations. Write that down. They make accusations. Make excuse me, accusations. They are always ready. Y'all know anybody that anytime something bad happened to somebody, they got something to say about it? Like, oh, you heard? Oh, that pastor fell. Like, man, I'm okay, but how you, but how you doing? You, you text me about more negative news than you do about how you doing. Some people thrive in hearing negative information about everybody, but the moment Something is said about them, guess what it is? It's fake news. No, nah, that ain't that, man. Come on, man. You know that wasn't me. You know that ain't the truth. Man, you know they always lying. Be careful of the bone carriers. Be careful of the bone carriers. We seem to think that the dog that bit someone else won't bite you. If you spit and poison and talking about everybody else around and you engage in the conversation what makes you think they won't talk about you next if you can't say to them hey man all right we don't talk about this enough you ain't got nothing else to talk about and they receive it that's a sign they just like mess some people like mess and the moment the mess gets close to them oh no 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 uh -uh. no 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 that ain't me and let's go a step further. I talk a lot about your circle, and the more God deals with me in this area, we really don't understand the importance of the people we call close to us in our inner circle. Sometimes your circle of influence will make you or break you because it is at your weakest point the devil attacks. Who does he use to attack you? The people closest to you. So if you don't understand that when you need God the most, sometimes that word that you need to hear will come from a friend, someone that you, you confide in, you're missing how God uses people. God uses people that way, but guess who does also? The devil. He'll wait till you're weak. You know, when, 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 when Jesus was fasting, God sent him a way to fast. When he finished fasting after 40 days, who was there to speak something to him? The devil. And what did he use? He used the word. The devil knows the word just as much as God knows the word. Just as much as you know the word. So how, who does the devil use to throw you off? Oh, yeah. I knew you should have never started that business. I don't know what she was thinking. Um, I knew that wasn't going to work. But you never once supported my business. Do you know the majority of business owners that start business are never supported by their close family members and friends? They have to be supported by people down the street because we don't want to make, we don't really want to see people win. And it'll be the same person that'll tell you, you know, God, I, I never thought God told you to start that business. You didn't, well, if he didn't or did, you didn't, you didn't buy nothing. You didn't give me a dollar. You didn't help me out, but you had no problem going to the QT, buying some candy. I've been selling candy for a year. You ain't bought nothing. Matter of fact, you hang up. Hey, hang, hold on a second. I'm at the gas station. I'm about to buy a soda. Bruh, I've been selling sodas for two months. You ain't bought nothing from me. It'll be the, so he uses people in your circle of influence. Those are the people who will come at you. And we don't, we take it for granted who we connect with. Everybody connected to you is not for you. Most accusations, most falsehoods come from within your inner circle. 
They come from within your inner circle. So they are always there watching closely, and they make accusations. They were sitting there waiting to catch him up. Let's go to verse 3. And he said to the man who had the withered hand, step forward. Now, what I love about that part is, is it shows that even in a situation that you notice the withered hand, man, he never asked God to heal him. He didn't really say anything. Kind of always wondered about that part. Like, if I saw Jesus, like, hey, can you, hey, what's up, bro? I heard about you. Can you? He didn't say anything. He didn't say, he didn't say a word. Um, and Jesus asked him in verse 3, he said to the man, step forward. God will always ask you to participate in your deliverance. He would. Now, sometimes he could just come through and something happen in, in the moment. But most times, I should say always, time, all the time, most times he would ask you to participate in your miracle or in your deliverance. The second thing I want you to catch about that is he told him to step forward because he wanted to make sure who saw it. The Pharisees. We always talk about God to bless you in the presence of your enemies. This is an example. Okay, y'all don't, y'all have y'all bypassed the man, you ignored him. I'm going to bless him, and I'm going to bless him right in front of you while you worried about the law. You worried about the law. You're ignoring the man, but I'm going to bless him right in front of you. Let's keep going. Um, then he said to them, y'all see the them? He's talking to everybody. He's not talking to just the withered, man, withered hand, man. He's talking to them. Is it lawful on the Sabbath to do good or to do evil, to save life or to kill life? But they kept silent. Hold on now. I'm confused. I'm confused. Are, are y'all confused? Did y'all catch that? Okay. If you go back to verse 2, I mean, verse chapter 2, verse 23. Who was the person as soon as the people, um, as soon as the disciples started picking the grain, popped up with something to say? The Pharisees. Now, here we are in chapter 3, a couple verses down. He is talking to them, but all of a sudden now, they got nothing to say. It's silent. The fifth thing you need to pay attention to is people who have something to say, when they are confronted with the truth, will be silent. They really punks. Can, I, can we just call a spade a spade? It chumps. You know, the, the, a punk is the, you got so much to say in my face, but when I find you at the school, you, you ain't, yeah, hey, man, I'm getting on the bus, man. Man, man, I ain't worried about it. Hold on now. You talk junk all day. Now that I stepped to you, what, what, you, what did you have to say? What, what did you say? You, you're silent. When you confront people who have so much to say, they will be silent because they really don't want to address, address the lies. They'll be silent. They don't have a response. They never had good intentions. Now, if you really wanted to engage in a conversation or a philosophical debate with Jesus about the law and son of man, wouldn't you respond right there? Wouldn't you say, okay, all right, Jesus, you asked the question, is it lawful on the Sabbath to do good or to do evil, save a life or kill? Wouldn't you say, okay, well, hey, let's go here, bro. We're going to go back and forth. They never had good intentions. They never really wanted to debate anything. They were just there to try to catch him up at a bad point, bad moment. Your haters, your, de your, de your detractors, the people who are speaking negativity on your job, some of them in your, some of you in your home, I ain't gonna go in your business. Some of them you're dating, dating somebody and they ain't got nothing positive to say, but you still holding on to that relationship. When you confront them about them, they don't have no response. Well, if you love me, can't you respond? I'm telling you, you've been killing me with your words, but you got no response. That's a sign that they never really had good intentions. If I tell you you're hurting me and you got nothing to say, did you ever really care about me? Is it, is it good to do, I mean, on, on, the, on the Sabbath, excuse me, is it lawful on the Sabbath to do good or to do evil, to save a life or kill? Save a life or kill, and you got nothing to say? You can't even respond to that? We're talking elementary, save a life or kill. 
silence. So the fifth point is when the truth is um, brought to them, they are silent. So let's go to verse 5, and it's about to get good, good. And when he looked, I mean, excuse me, when he had looked around at them with anger, being grieved by the hardness of their hearts, he said to the man, stretch out your hand. And he stretched, out his, stretched it out, and his hand was restored as whole as the other. Now, I'm going to stay here for a minute, and I'm going to park in verse 5 for a minute, because it's a lot of things that I want, I want you to see right here. This is not number 6. This is, this is just some nuggets in verse 5. One of the first things that jumped out, me, jumped out to me about verse 5 is, ask yourself, and write this down. This is something that you need to go back to this week. This, this might even be a Bible study series in September. Do you know what angers God? Do we really know what angers God? Do you know? Don't assume you know. Do you really know what angers God? Because a lot of us are doing things that angers God, and we're wondering why we're not getting responses from God. Do you know what angers God? In this example, what angered God was the hardened hearts. Hardened hearts. Now, we just did, and things just tie in so smoothly. We just did the full soul um, session. And what did we talk about in the four souls? There was only one, 25% that produced the fruit. Now, this got me to thinking, and I'm going to challenge y'all on this. When we did that series, how many of y'all thought, and you ain't got to raise your hand, just ask yourself, how many of y'all really thought you were the 25%? Think about it. Did you go through that series thinking, Lord, I might be the 75% of the people who ain't producing no fruit. I need to make changes. We are not conditioned to think we are the problem. I'll prove it to you. Do you watch a movie and think you're the villain? in the movie you don't come on let's be honest with ourselves you don't nobody thinks they're the joker do you think you're the joker when you watch the movie you, you don't think you're the joker we don't look at ourselves and ever think when you read scriptures in the bible you we never think we 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 never think the person in that scripture in that story that needed to repent is us. The person that needed to make a change is us. We normally think either you, we're the hero or we're the person that's looking for God to perform a miracle for us. We don't ever think we were the person that pushed the person out of the way trying to get to God. Yeah, that's deep, ain't it, Carl? It's deep. It's deep. Because I had to, I had to kept, check myself, challenge myself. Do you really know what makes God angry it's a hardened heart now the percentages and i'm not gonna mess with you but it's, it is what it is he gave us four types of soil only 25 percent one of four produced fruit the other ones didn't produce fruit or they didn't produce fruit that, that um that lasted do you think that out of everyone that listens or read that passage of scripture everybody is the 25 percent it's not mathematically possible are you walking around, or are we walking around doing things that angers God, but then reading the, the scripture and never realizing, am I the modern day Pharisee? Y'all don't like that. Y'all get quiet there. I knew you was gonna get quiet there. Because that's we don't we are narcissistic. Our narcissistic behavior makes us feel like that's never me. You can see a story, and you can watch a movie and see something that's impactful. But we don't watch it, and especially in America, we don't watch that movie with the lens of, man, am I the person that need counseling? Nah, nah, girl, you need to. What we do is, hey, Caldwell, man, I saw this movie. You need to watch it because it speaks to a lot of things you're going through, and I think you could benefit from it. And I think you might need some counseling too. So again, check that movie out. Call me back when you when you when you when you take a listen to it. Call Will. I heard an awesome message last night, man, and it was, whew. When I was listening to it, I thought about you. 
the Lord put you in my spirit. He did. He did. Elder Donald, you preached, man, great message, great message. And you know what you talked about last week, launching into the deep. I, you know what? I sent that to a friend of mine because they've been sitting on the couch, won't apply for a job. And I said, you need to launch into the deep. The Lord, the Lord, the word of the Lord is speaking. And you've been on your job for 20 years, ain't sent an application. All you do is complain about you ain't got the promotion. And the launching of the deep message was for you. But we don't read scripture. We don't read the Bible and apply it to us. Most of us read the Bible and we look for someone to apply it to. That's a Pharisee behavior. Because the Pharisees knew the word, but the word for them, it didn't apply to them. Hey, hey, we do good deeds. We just do the right thing. This other stuff, hey, that, that's you. Do we know what God does not like? I'm convinced we don't because there's too many mean people. He didn't give us an example of doing something miraculous when he asked the, the Pharisees. He said, on the Sabbath, is it lawful to do good or to do evil? Is it lawful to save a life or to kill? That's elementary. Do you know that the parables that Jesus wrote, he, that he taught, were in, they were basically on the second, between the second and the third and the fifth grade level. The third and the fifth grade level. He was reach, reaching multitudes, teaching biblical principles that could have been grasped by someone on the third to the fifth grade level. He was trying to reach people where they were, not trying to be all deep. Are you reading the word and you so deep that you shallow? Because I go into them and say, I think most of us, I ain't pointing you out, most of us are. Because we don't, we, we, it's the way we approach life. We approach life. We don't look at things and say, is it me? But the scripture is for you to search yourself. Save yourself. So that's one of the first concepts I want you to catch from verse 5. But then also, and, and this is a little tad bit, people who have hard hearts are connected to stubborn minds that lead to loud mouths. Did y'all get that? People who have hard hearts are connected to stubborn minds who have and lead to loud mouths. They go together. When your heart is hard, it leads to your brain and your mind telling you, hey, I, I got it together. And then you start speaking out your mouth what you think. And you start hurting people with your mouth. The second part of that scripture that, that stands out to me is, verse 5 is, well, he said, stretch out your hand. We talked about it earlier. Stretching out, stretching out his hand, the withered hand, was an act of faith and obedience. It was a demonstration of the living word in action. It was the miracle that he was providing to be clearly demonstrated in front of the biblical scholars who ignored the man the whole time. He was in the synagogue, which was, ma which was managed by the Pharisees. He wanted them to see. Y'all so busy up in his scholaring, you are missing the needs of the people. The first person Jesus passes when he goes into the synagogue is the withered hand. I would beg to say they probably passed the man with the withered hand every day. They passed him every day. But you know what happens when you get passed up every day? Sometimes you start believing that God don't have nothing better for you either. Why can I say that? He didn't ask for nothing. He didn't ask for nothing. How many of y'all have become your own Pharisee? We talking about people always have something to say. How many of us have become our own people to have something to say? You don't need nobody to talk you out of your blessing. You talk yourself out of it. It don't take long. You shout in church, go outside. Man, it's hot. I don't know what we're going to do. Hold on now. You just heard a word telling you you can do all things through Christ that strengthen you. The first thing you open your mouth and say when you get in the car is, I don't know what we's going to do. I don't know what we's going to do. No, it's improper English, but you get the point. Let's move on. Verse 6, and we're done. 
Um, then the Pharisees went out and immediately plotted with the Herodians against him how they might destroy him. The sixth and last point I want to make is they're hypocrites. People who have a lot to say are hypocrites. What do you mean, Michael? Um, we just read in Mark chapter 2, verses 23 to the end, that they talked about what ain't lawful on the, on the Sabbath. We, we saw that Jesus questioned them, and they have no response about is it lawful on the Sabbath to do good or do evil, to save or to kill. Y'all didn't catch anything that would have been done on the Sabbath in verse 6? What, what, what are they doing in, on the Sabbath in, in verse 6? Um, if, if, if you can't save somebody, if you can't pluck grain to eat, wouldn't it be working for you to plot to destroy? So you're going to go meet with the Herodians and the plot against him that they might destroy him. But that's okay on the Sabbath. People who have something to say, they are hypocrites because you get so, they get so caught up in their agenda that they forget that what they're telling you not to do, they're doing themselves. How are you plotting to kill somebody and destroy someone on the Sabbath, but then you tell somebody you can't eat on the Sabbath? How crazy is that? I was going to do a demonstration. I'm out of time. But this is literally the scene. I'm sitting right here. And I'm Jesus. I walk into the synagogue. This is the man with the withered hand. Caldwell and Elder Donald are the Pharisees over here talking, whispering to each other, but we ain't saying nothing to me. I'm talking to the man, telling him to stretch out his hands. We're in the synagogue that these two Negroes manage, and y'all, instead of praising God that he's been healed, y'all go to the corner and say, hey, man, we, we, he doing another miracle on the Sabbath. We got him. How crazy is that example of someone who is supposed to be a spiritual leader that you have completely forgot your job, but now you just want to plot to kill somebody? That when God is moving, you in the corner plotting. You ain't happy. You ain't. You, you mad. Look at him, Lord. He got a, his hand healed. He don't done it again on the Sabbath. Lord, look what's going on. In the center, he, he, Jesus healing people in the synagogue. We can't do it. That, hey, man, let's go get with the Herodians. And guess what? And this is something that everybody needs to hear. Marvin, play the music so they can let them know I'm done. You know, the music you hear in the background means I'm done. Y'all know y'all. That's how church is. You, you got to hear the music and you know, hey, we getting out of here. We're getting out of here. But what's so crazy about this whole thing? <laughs> you had so much to say about grain. You had absolutely no praise, no worship, no, no notice, no nothing of a man being healed right in front of your eyes that you ignored. You ignored the man. You ignored the man. That is astonishing to me that in a, and it's happening now, people can get so caught up in your, your, your doctrine and your denomination that God's trying to move and he can't move in your church because he ain't there. God moves where he can, the spirit moves where it can move freely. We do so many things to lock it up. And, and, and what's weird, what, what's, and, uh, and, I won't, and someone needs to hear this, and we're closing. When they said they, they, plotted, um, they, um, they plotted with the Herodians against him, how they might destroy him, do y'all know where that plot, where it was leading to? Come on, y'all. The cross. These are the people who helped bring up the charges, which was one of Jesus working on the Sabbath that nailed our Savior to the cross. So, in conclusion, <clears throat> let the talk lead you to your purpose. Don't let the talk throw you off the track. There is a purpose behind the talk. If you allow it, let it fuel you. Oh, you talking? Oh, no. Oh, okay, I see. You got something to say. My God shall supply all my needs. I am the head and not the tail. I'm above only, but 
you got to be able to speak the word and believe it and act on it. But if you get stuck listening to the people talking, you miss the purpose. His purpose, and, and part of why I think Jesus said, hey, everywhere he went, there's so many examples in the Bible. He went places and did things. He did it on the Sabbath, and the Pharisee was there talking. I think he, I know, think about it. He knew, okay, I could say something to you. I could come at you. I could do this. But if I do, then that means it takes away from the plan my father sent me to do. Have they taken you off your plan? Have the naysayers, the detractors, the haters, the people who got so much to say, whatever category you want to put them in, have they taken you off the plan that God told you? Did he tell it to you in 2022 and you still hadn't done it in 2024? Because somebody told you, girl, I wouldn't go back to school. It's too expensive, man. You don't need no degree. Yes, you do. Yes, you do. Go back to school. Did he tell you to start the new, the new business and you still looking for somebody to fund you the money? God said, use what you got. I'll take what you got and I'll multiply it. Don't worry if don't nobody that you know close to you help seed your business. Just do it. I'll, you made one step, I'll take two. But you still stuck on one step because of what somebody said. So let what people say fuel you where God is trying to take you because he's there with you. He's there with you. He's just waiting to see who you put your trust in. Y'all staying. Let's go. I'm done. Who are you going to put your trust in? Stop listening to the people who always got something to say. They're not going nowhere. Every move you make, every step you take, they're going to be there. They're going to have something to say. Just make sure that you ain't one of the Pharisees. Amen. Lord, we thank you. Let us pray. Lord, we thank you for this day. We thank you for your word. Lord, we know that we all have our trials and tribulations. We all have our ups and downs. We all have our moments when we're weak. We ask in those moments where we have a hard time hearing from you and we are blocking out your voice and we're listening to the voice of people that we reverse that and we understand that the only voice that matters is yours. Sometimes you will send us a word that is specific to us, a word that you want us to act on, but it is the devil's job to kill, steal, and destroy that word. But if we keep our mind stayed on you, if we keep you in front of everything we do, if we keep the main thing the main thing, we know in the end we'll win. So, Lord, as we close out this message, we ask that, we, we ask that you remind us of just what you called us to do. Some of us have forgotten what you called us to do. We've forgotten what the, the plans that you have for us. We've forgotten the promises that you made to us. Bring that back to our remembrance. Put a fire under our feet to understand that if we want to make the next move, we got to stretch out. Somebody today needs to stretch out and say, Lord, I'm going to make the step. I'm going to stretch out because I know if I stretch out, you won't let me fall. Wherever I'm reaching to, wherever I'm trying to go, you're there with me. You, you'll hold my hand up. As long as I got Jesus by my side, you'll hold my hand up and you'll show me the way. I don't see it now. I don't know how you're going to do it. I don't know how it's going to come to fruition. I just know that if I praise you, if I stay where you called me to stay, if I do what you called me to do, you'll make a way. So right now, I'm going to praise you in advance for what you're going to do. I'm going to praise you in advance for what you're going to do. I'm going to give you thanks. I'm going to give you glory because I don't have to see it now. I can praise you in advance because I know you do all things well. We'll forever magnify and praise your name. In Jesus' name, we pray. Amen. Give him a praise for what you know God's going to do in your life. And for somebody, he's going to do it in front of your enemies. The people who are talking about you, he's going to do it right in front of them. He's going to bless you with the business. He's going to bless you with the degree. You're going to walk across the stage, and they're going to be sitting right there. Because <laughs> guess what? They're always there. <laughs> but God's going to open up whatever door. Y'all don't believe that, do you? Some of y'all praying for stuff that y'all don't believe. Can you praise God for what you asked him for that you don't have yet, but you know that God's going to give it to you? That takes faith. Faith is, all right, I'm going to it's offering time. We're going to uh, ask Elder Donna to come forth and um, bless our offering. And we're going to roll out. Lord, we thank you for your word, first of all. We thank you for being so good in so many ways. Father, we come unto thee at this time that you may bless the giver, Lord. Lord, multiply as you are taught with you in your word, the giver. Father, we pray, Lord, that you may bless our offering, Lord, that you may use it to your glory. Lord, we thank you for you. We thank you, Lord. We thank you right now. And we're going to count as done right now. As you're taught within, within your word, 
Lord, we believe it, and we're going to give you praise. In Jesus' name we pray. songs ever written. Amen. Love that song. Hope the word has been a blessing to you. Um, in the form of announcements, not many. Um, we'll be back Tuesday at 645. We only have maybe two more weeks, three more weeks of the um, the Bible study series, um, Living My Blessed Life. And ironically, I didn't go here. Um, we talked about mercy. Um, Nicodemus was a Pharisee. So a lot of people don't know that. So the, 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 the flip of that is, is, you know, you still have to show mercy to the people who threw fire at you. Nicodemus became a follower of Christ, but he was a Pharisee. So that ties in with the Bible study, but a little extra there. But we'll be finishing that up at the end of July. Um, as I said before, we're getting ready to start implementing, getting back to our um, youth church uh, in, the, in the fall. More to come on that. And we'll be doing some back to school activities in August. Do y'all know the summer's like almost over? Carl was talking about in the car. Some people back at school in like two weeks. Yeah, yeah, that, that's crazy, right? I hope y'all enjoyed your hot summer. Because <laughs> hey, your hot boy, your hot girl summer, it's about over, literally. So this, the 15th of um, July is what? What, Tuesday? Four, 14th of June? No, that's t tomorrow. Oh, God. Okay, yeah, so y'all got bills to pay on the 15th. They do tomorrow. <laughs> Um, so the, sum, the summer is moving. You'll be halfway through July. So I hope y'all are enjoying yourself. Um, uh, we will do, like I said, some back to school stuff in July, I mean in August. And in September is going to be evangelism month. So we're putting some stuff together, um, evangelism month, and we're going to be um, honoring our um, pastor and, um, and first lady as well. So, again, um, more to come on those announcements. Enjoy your Sunday. Thank you for worshiping with us online. If you're online, thank you so much um, on Facebook and YouTube for uh, being on, online with us, the majority are online. So we thank you uh, for being online. And this time, we're going to ask Elder Donald to close us out with our benediction. Continue prayers for the um, Watson family. Amen. Just about here is one more time. Most gracious Father, we thank you, Lord, for your word again. Lord, we ask, Lord, that you may bless this, this week, Lord, those that are traveling. We're still in the vacation days and and my father we pray lord that you may bless bless your people lord and bless lord oh lord this week in jesus name we pray may the grace of god rest our battle with us let us all say amen